Good evening, everyone. This is Father Vince Lampert, and I'm happy to be with you on this episode of St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology's new virtual event. My goal this evening will be to be speaking on the biblical roots of exorcism. It's good to be back with all of you. Some of you are familiar with some other interviews I've done with the St. Paul Center, as well as perhaps the book that I wrote, Exorcism, the Battle Against Satan and His Demons. So again, just sit back, enjoy this event, and hopefully you're going to come away with a better understanding of why the church teaches what it does about the ministry of exorcism. The world that Jesus came to redeem is saturated with the presence of demons. In the Christian tradition, we rely first and foremost on biblical revelation when we speak of the reality of the devil and the importance of exorcism ministry. Scripture gives many accounts about the reality of the devil and his harmful and destructive influence on humans. The struggle manifests itself in varied ways that includes the affliction of people, things, and places. The church recognizes four different types of extraordinary demonic activity, the way that the devil tries to create an entry point into our lives. The first would be demonic infestation, the presence of evil in a location associated with an object or even in an animal. The second type would be demonic vexation. These are physical attacks that a person receives from a demon, such as cuts and marks and bites and bruises, perhaps even letters that appear on a person's body for a period of time and then subside. The third type is demonic obsession. This is the attacks of the devil to try to influence a person mentally. Literally, the devil is trying to get inside of a person's head so that everything that they experience, things that they think about, are filtered through the presence of the demonic. And then we have demonic possession, whereby the devil or one of his demons would take control of a person's body, treating that body as if it were its own. For example, using the person's mouth to speak, their ears to hear, their eyes to see, their arms and hands to give gestures. When it comes to demonic possession, a clear distinction always has to be made between the person as an individual and now the demon, which is using that person's body as if it were its own. And when it is the demon, then all the actions of that person's body are now wholly defined by the demon and not by that individual. The church further teaches that there are four things that can help bring credibility to the question if one is truly dealing with the demonic or not. So there are four things that I've been trained to look for. Number one would be the ability to speak a language otherwise unknown to the individual. So in working with someone, I would know whether or not that person has the capacity to speak another language. So if that begins to occur when I'm interviewing someone, that might lead me to believe that this is no longer the person, but perhaps the presence of a demon. The second thing would be superhuman strength beyond the normal capacity of the individual. So demons would have the capacity to use the body in ways that that person as an individual would not be able to do. The third thing I would look for is elevated perception, meaning that once the demon manifests, it's able to reveal things that that person as an individual would not otherwise know. And the ability to know these things would be based on the angelic nature of a demon. Because even though they are fallen angels, they still retain the quality of being able to have the infused knowledge about things in the natural order that God gave to them when they were first created. And then the fourth thing is an aversion to anything of a sacred nature, such as being in a sacred space, a church or a chapel, being blessed with holy water, being shown a crucifix, having the word of God read before them, or even being blessed with a relic. It's also possible to know that an evil spirit is present when symptoms of the demonic are observed. These include, we learn these from sacred scripture, bodily contortions or convulsions, 
mentioned in Mark 1, 26. That same passage talks about crying out in a loud voice. Demons will have a very deep voice, being very authoritative as a way to try to convince us that they are in control and that anyone else around them is inferior to them. There can be a change in physical appearance, such as foaming at the mouth, eyes rolled in the back of the head, and so on. All of these manifestations are meant to be tricks by the devil as a way to try to convince us that we need to focus more on him as opposed to focusing on the power of God. Now, the word devil comes from the Greek word diabolos, which means adversary, slanderer, opposer. It occurs 33 times in the New Testament. The word Satan comes from the Hebrew, and it means accuser. It occurs 34 times in the New Testament. Another term that is often used for Satan is Lucifer. It's a reference to Isaiah 14, verses 12 through 13. Satan is a morally wicked creature, hostile to both humans and God. He is not wicked by nature, but because of vice. As the Book of Wisdom teaches us in chapter 2, verse 24, through the devil's envy, death entered the world. Because again, how did that happen? Because when the serpent in the garden spoke to Eve and said that she would not die, that's exactly what happened. Now, this wicked creature is also named by his maleficent activity. He is branded as the evil one 12 times in the New Testament. And the final plea in the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, is, pe- is to be delivered from him. Matthew 5.37 and Matthew 6.13. He is also the enemy, the adversary, the one who sows weeds in the field. Matthew 13.39. As the enemy, he is the spirit of the Antichrist who does not confess Jesus. 1 John 4.3. He is also called a murderer from the beginning, one who has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks according to his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Inasmuch as he draws humans into evil, he is the tempter or the seducer. Satan is also the enormous dragon. The book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 3, and chapter 13, verse 2. He's also called the ancient serpent, Again, the book of Revelation, chapter 12, verse 9, chapter 20, verse 2. And the dragon, whose tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. Revelation 12, 4. The book of Revelation goes on to speak of the fall of the devil and his angels in these words. It comes from chapter 12, verse 12. Now the salvation and the power of the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ has come, for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Rejoice then, O heaven, and you that dwell therein. But woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. I would suggest that the mission of Jesus is one as a reconquest, an enterprise to wrestle humanity away from our servitude to Satan and to restore all of us to a right relationship with God. The word that we often use is the word redemption. How many of us truly know what the word redemption means? It literally means to buy back. When Jesus died on the cross, he brought all of us back from Satan. We were sold into slavery to Satan by our first parents when they chose to disobey God and to eat of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So again, it is Jesus who pays the price for that sin and in doing so affords all of us the opportunity to once again be able to approach the tree of life.
because we know that when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, the fiery sword and the cherubim were put up so that they could not approach the tree of life. I would even suggest that this was a particular gift and grace from God, because if Adam and Eve had approached the tree of life in the state of original sin, then there would have been no hope for their redemption and our redemption. Again, they would have been solidified in their choice. And as a result, we would have all been in eternal damnation. Therefore, Jesus's mission is one of exorcism. It's a battle against Satan and his demons who disfigure the human person who has been created in the image and likeness of God. The first letter of John says in 3.8, the reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. In the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 38, we are told he went about doing good and healing all those who were oppressed by the devil. Throughout his life, Jesus encountered demon after demon. Indeed, after his baptism, he was driven by the spirit into the desert to be tempted by Satan after which he then calls his first disciples and his very first act of public ministry was to help a man with an unclean spirit. Mark 21, 28 in chapter one. Now the crowds marveled at Jesus because with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits and they obey him. Mark 1, 27. Jesus then went throughout all Galilee preaching in their synagogues and casting out demons, Mark 1, 39. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God, Mark 3, 11. Again, when we look at scripture, there are so many references to the fact that Jesus took the ministry of exorcism quite seriously. There are many people today who would say Jesus was not performing exorcisms. Jesus knew the mindset of the day and he was just playing into that mindset. But again, I believe that that would be looking and reading too much into sacred scripture. Again, when we look at the biblical references to exorcism, Jesus clearly demonstrates that evil is personified in what we call the devil and his demons and is not just a metaphor for humanity's inhumane treatment of one another. Here are some other references to Jesus dealing with the demonic. The temptation of Jesus in the desert. It's mentioned in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Again in Mark chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. Again in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Jesus has been baptized immediately after his baptism. He's driven into the desert where he has to face the devil. And what does the devil want him to do? To abandon his mission so that humanity would be trapped in sin, as are the devil and his demons. It's always interesting when reading the accounts, especially those in Matthew and Luke, that the devil really is trying to convince Jesus to show his hand. The devil, by virtue of his infused knowledge that he received at the moment of his creation, was able to see God's plan of creation and for humanity. And then the devil would know that humanity one day would have the capacity of being elevated higher than him. And because of the great sin of pride within the devil, this is something that he could not accept. And so he rejected God. And then he wants humanity to make the same poor choice that he himself has made so that we too would be trapped permanently in sin again as are he and his demons. So how, what does the devil do? He really tempts Jesus, really looking at the seven deadly sins, the one beginning with gluttony. What does he say to Jesus after spending 40 days in the desert? If you are the son of God, command these stones to turn to bread. In other words, give in to your desire. 
we know that that's exactly what happened to Eve in the garden. She gave in to gluttony, if you will, and violated God's command to not to eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But Jesus is able to refute the temptation of the devil. And the way that he does that is by having a correct understanding of the word of God. Now, it's interesting that the devil, you know, he's a quick learner. Jesus is quoting scripture. So he further tempts him. And what does he try to do? He also quotes scripture. But again, he's trying to twist it for his own purposes, which is why we learn the importance of always having a correct understanding of the word of God. Again, another example. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, we are told, no one can serve two masters, for he will either hate one and love the other, or will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. And I would suggest that this is a really a clear indication to all of us that we cannot be divided in our commitment to God. God wants 100 percent, and we cannot be divided, giving some of ourselves to God and giving some of ourselves to Satan by giving into the temptations that he sends his way. Reflecting even recently, the church is now reading from Luke's gospel on Sunday. A few weeks ago, we heard the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. And in the story of the prodigal son, we heard the story of the lost son. You know, many of us might think one lost sheep out of 100, 99% is still pretty good. But that's not good enough for God. He wants 100% of us. The woman who has 10 coins and loses one. Again, we might think 90% is pretty good. We can write off the one. But again, with God, everyone matters 100%. The story of the prodigal son. Again, he matters in the eyes of God. God wants salvation and redemption for all of us. 100% truly matters. We cannot be half-hearted in our commitment to God. We have to give him our total selves. Again, the line from Matthew 6, 24, you cannot serve both God and mammon. God needs to be the number one priority in our lives. And when he is not, the devil will try to take advantage of that as an opportunity, as a way to drive us further away from God. Another passage, Jesus heals the Gerasene demoniac. In Matthew 8, 28, 34, it says the Gadarene demoniacs. In Matthew 5, 1 through 20, and in Luke 8, 26 through 39, we hear the story of just one Gerasene demoniac. Again, in this passage, we see a man who's possessed by legion. He's living in the tombs. So he's amongst the dead, if you will. The passage even tells us that fetters will not hold him. There's the example of superhuman strength. And then we also see where the demons recognize who Jesus is. They beg to be sent into the swine. Jesus sends them into the swine. And then the demons show their true character by destroying the swine, by racing over the hillside, and then drowning the swine in the lake. Again, that's also a sign of demonic infestation, the presence of a demon in an animal. Always love the story of the Gerasene demoniac because it demonstrates just how important we are to God and the importance of living in a right relationship. The man who's now free of legion wants to follow Jesus down the road, but Jesus says to him, no, go home to your family. Jesus takes a man who is living amongst the dead and places him back amongst the living because it's important for all of us to live in healthy relationships. All of us know that we experience a certain amount of brokenness in our lives. But when we experience brokenness, we cannot give in to anger, resentment, or bitterness, revenge, or whatever. We always need to seek healing. It doesn't mean it will come quickly. It doesn't mean that it will be easy, 
but all of us need to strive to learn to forgive one another because it is one of the key ingredients of the Christian life. It's always been said that when we choose not to forgive somebody, it's like we ourselves drink a deadly poison and then we're looking at the other person waiting for them to drop over. The person who gets hurt the most when we do not forgive in the manner that Christ has taught us to forgive usually is ourselves. So again, the importance of always seeking healthy relationships. In Matthew 10, 1, we're told, and he called to him his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits. Mark 3, 14 says, and he appointed 12 to be with him and to be sent out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. These passages in the Catholic tradition are the reason why the bishop is the exorcist in his diocese. The bishop is the successor to the apostles. Jesus gave to his apostles the authority to cast out all unclean spirits. And then a bishop at his discretion may bestow this charism on one or more of his priests. So as the exorcist for the Archdiocese of Indianapolis, I act in the name of my bishop. Again, he has the authority based on his Episcopal ordination, and then he has called me to act in his name in doing this ministry. We look at Matthew 12, verses 22 through 32, Mark 3, 20 through 26, and Luke 11, 14 through 23. It's the story of Jesus and Beelzebul. Beelzebul meaning the devil, the Lord of the flies. Why that name, Lord of the flies? Where do you see flies? Around the dead. And again, we know that through the devil's envy, death entered into the world. These pas passages state, then he went home and the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. And when his friends heard it, they went out to see him for they said, he is beside himself. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul and by the prince of demons, he cast out demons. And he called them to him and said to them in parables, how can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. Again, Jesus was accused by virtue of addressing demonic reality of being in league with Satan himself. Another passage, the man with an unclean spirit found in Luke 4, 31 through 37, and again in Mark 1, 21 through 28. Mark writes, and they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying with a loud voice came out of him. Again, this shows the power and the authority that Jesus has over unclean spirits and the fact that he taught with authority. When the church performs an exorcism, she operates in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. I like to remind people that as an exorcist, I don't have any special powers or abilities. If people are relying on me, we're all in trouble. But if people are relying on the power and the authority of Christ that he has given to his church and that is operative in his ministers, that is the correct mindset to have. And that's so important today because I've seen a growing trend in recent years for many people who have become disconnected with the church and with faith who are dealing with the demonic, they will contact me 
and treat me as if I were a magician, as if I had special powers or abilities, or I had certain tricks up my sleeve, if you will, that I could use to make the demonic presence in their lives go away. Again, I would say, getting rid of the demonic is the easy part. The most important thing is to bring people into a relationship with Jesus Christ. In Mark 7, verses 24 through 30, it's the story of the Syrophoenician woman and her great faith. It's the line where she says, even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from their master's table. Sometimes people might read this passage and say, it seems rather harsh for Jesus to kind of refer to this woman as a dog. But Jesus is using this as an opportunity to bring forth the woman's faith. Because of her faith, great things were able to happen in her life. Many of you might recall that when Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth, it said that he wasn't able to perform many mighty deeds there. So much did their lack of faith distress him. So it's not just a matter of what I do in an exorcism. It's really important that the afflicted person have the right mindset, the desire to grow in faith, and then eventually holiness and virtue and become the person that God truly wants them to be. In Mark 9, verses 14 through 29, it's the healing of a boy with a mute spirit. In this passage, we hear the classic line, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. It speaks of the importance of the discipline of the exorcist. Again, I need to prepare myself. Scripture really points that out, that I need to be in a state of grace, if you will, when I perform an exorcism. We all know that when a priest uh, celebrates a sacrament, his personal character doesn't come into play. Even if the priest is a bad person, if you will, when he celebrates a wedding, the person's still married. When he does a baptism, they're still baptized. When he celebrates the Eucharist, it's still the body and blood of Christ. But this is not true in the world of exorcism. If I'm not in a good state of grace, then I will not be effective in combating the devil because the devil knows exactly those who are working against him and he will do everything in his power to try to trip up the ministry of exorcism and the rite itself. Another passage, Luke 11, verses 24 through 26. It's the story of the, of the return of the unclean spirit. This passage teaches us that it's not enough for the unclean spirit to be cast out, but God has to be invited in. Again, the account tells us that once the unclean spirit has been cast out, it goes and wanders through the arid wasteland and coming back and finding the house swept clean, it goes and finds seven other demons worse than itself and they come back and take up residence in the person and the person's situation is worse than it was before. Being swept clean means the demon is gone, but God has not been invited in to fill that void. Whenever an exorcism is performed, the exorcist must be convinced that the person has the desire to grow in holiness and virtue. It's not enough for the demon to be gone. God must be invited in. Even in the ministry of exorcism, there is a protocol that we priests in the United States follow because we need to reach moral certitude that the person in front of us is truly dealing with the demonic. Number one would be to have a thorough psychiatric evaluation. Number two would be to have a physical examination by a medical doctor. The church wants experts in these fields to weigh in on a matter so that I can rely on their expertise and their knowledge in helping me to come to the conclusion whether or not if someone is truly dealing with the demonic. Step three is an intake questionnaire, trying to determine what was the entry point for the demonic into this person's life. Step four would be to look for those four signs of extraordinary demonic activity. The ability to speak and understand languages otherwise unknown to the individual, having superhuman strength, elevated perception, and a negative reaction to anything of a sacred nature. 
And step number five, and this is tied into that passage from Luke 11, 24 through 26, is to help the person resume their spiritual life or to bring them to Christ for the very first time. Again, it's not enough for the demon to be cast out. God must be invited in. And I can tell you that in the 17 years that I have done this ministry, there have been a few occasions where I have chosen not to work with someone who I truly believe was dealing with the demonic simply because that person wanted nothing to do with God. And again, in an exorcism, Jesus is not a bystander. He is the main actor. And if people don't want anything to do with God, then there's really no way to help them. Now, evil is a reality, and Jesus has power and authority over Satan and all of his demons. Jesus shared this power with his disciples. There's a great story when on one occasion, when returning from one of their missions, the disciples say to Jesus, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Jesus replies, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Luke 10, 18. This statement is so profound because this fall of Satan signifies the coming of the kingdom of God and the fact that Jesus Christ has ended Satan's dominion over humanity. Satan, as the accuser, is no longer effective in the accusations he makes against us before God because from now on, we have Jesus as our intercessor. In the person of Jesus Christ, God shows his mercy and is no longer mindful of the sins that placed us under Satan's power. The great line from the cross, from Luke 23, 34, where Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I was reading another book recently by Archbishop Fulton Sheen, And it was kind of very profound because in commenting on this passage from Luke 23, uh, verse 34, Archbishop Sheen spoke about divine ignorance. The fact that Jesus' love and mercy for us is so great that on the day of judgment, if we're truly repentant and sorry for our sins, if the love of God can be found and truly be found within us, then something amazing will happen. Fulton Sheen says, God will allow himself to forget the sins that we have done and only focus on his love and mercy that he has for each and every one of us. Again, he called this divine ignorance. Now, the battle against Satan is not one without combat. Throughout the Bible, Satan stubbornly insists on preventing the coming of the kingdom of God. Satan tries in the desert from the very beginning of Jesus's public life to divert him from his mission. I referenced that earlier in the accounts of Jesus and his temptation in the desert. St. Peter will do the same later. And for that reason, Jesus says to him in Matthew 16, 23, get behind me, Satan. Satan is the one who puts into the heart of Judas the plan to betray Jesus. John 13, 2. He even enters into Judas, Luke 22, verse 3. Now, after attempting Jesus in the desert, Luke's gospel tells us that Satan departed from him until an opportune time. Verse chapter 4, verse 13. Now, Satan believes that the crucifixion is that time, his hour, but he is mistaken because the crucifixion is the hour of Christ. Jesus cries out from the cross in Luke 22, verse 42. Father, if it be your will, let this cup pass for me, yet not my will, but yours be done. In contrast to Adam, Jesus resists Satan with his unfailing obedience to the will of the Father. It can be said that the whole life and suffering of Jesus are a yes to God and consequently, a no to Satan. I always love the fact, why does a priest hold up a crucifix during an exorcism? Because the the priest is saying to the demon, 
The moment that you thought that you won is actually the moment of your defeat. Jesus defeated you on the cross. You will be defeated again through this ministry of exorcism. So do not resist the power and the authority of Christ crucified. Again, the reason why a crucifix is used. Now, Satan, thus conquered, begins a battle with the church, which is the seed of the kingdom of God. Satan does everything that he can do to really stymie the growth of the church. His desire would be to influence humanity to reject God as he has done. Satan stirs up persecutions, heresies, and dissension. He obstructs St. Paul's missionary activity. First letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 18. He claims Christ's disciples in order to sift them like wheat. Luke 22, verse 31. He strives through temptation to separate every believer from Christ, to snatch the word from their heart, lest the person believe and be saved. Luke 8, verse 12. And so we are warned in 1 Peter 5, 9. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, solid in your faith. I like to remind everyone, we don't have to do anything extraordinary as Catholics to defeat the devil. The things that defeat him are the ordinary aspects of our faith. As a Catholic, if you're going to Mass, if you're praying, you're celebrating the sacramental life of the church, if you're reading the Word of God, the devil is already on the run. Again, living out the ordinary aspects of our faith defeats the devil. And why? Because these, as these aspects of our faith have come to us directly from Christ himself. So the devil is using all kinds of activity to try to impact us, to afflict us, and to really get us to go off the path to eternal life to which Christ is calling all of us. The good news is that eventually all of this maleficent activity will come to an end with the definitive banishment of Satan into the eternal fire. Matthew 25, verse 41. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelation 20, verse 10. Until that day, the Lord has given us the ministry of exorcism to help those who have fallen under the influence of Satan and his demons. How do we fight this battle? The answer is with the word of God, the Bible. The great biblical scholar of the church, St. Jerome, who died in the year 420, has given us the great line, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. To that I would add that ignorance of Christ empowers the devil. Therefore, knowing scripture, knowing the Bible, knowing the word of God, we come to know Christ, and in knowing Christ, Satan and his demons are defeated. You know, in the book that I wrote on exorcism, the battle against Satan and his demons, I go into a lot further detail about what we learn from the demons when they are confronted. There is some practical insight mentioned from the Gospel of Mark. And I just want to go through a few of these things to point them out. So when we look at the account from Mark's Gospel in chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, what do we learn? The demons understand the identity of Jesus. They know the mission of Jesus, and they want to disrupt it. Demons act in clusters. Again, it usually isn't that there's only one demon. There's usually multiple demons. When the angels fell, they fell from all nine choirs. And so just as much as there is a hierarchy in the angelic world, there is a hierarchy in the demonic world. And when someone is possessed, there is a higher ranking demon that is in control, if you will, of a cluster of demons that are afflicting the person. Demons recognize the authority of Jesus. 
we know who you are, the Holy One of God. Again, we look at the story of the Gerasene demoniac in Mark 5, 1 through 20. What are some of the things that we learn? That the demon works on people who live in isolation. There are far too many people today who say, I don't need to go to church. I can pray to God on my own. But these people fail to realize the important role that other people will play in our lives. The notion there is safety in numbers. Even when we go to church on Sunday, there may be people sitting in the pews around us that we do not know. But it's important that they are there because in sharing a common faith, we help to lift one another up. And by lifting one another up, we can be protected from the evil one. What did Jesus himself say? Wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. We look at the story of the Syrophoenician woman's faith in Mark 7, 24 through 30. We know that an exorcism cannot be performed on someone against their will. Somebody has to ask for it. But in this case, the mother could ask for her daughter because as her mother, she has a certain authority over her daughter. Again, we learn exorcisms require a profession of faith because it's not just what I'm doing per se, but what God is accomplishing through this prayer of the church. Again, the person has to have the desire to grow in holiness and virtue. The other thing we learn in this passage is that exorcisms can take place from a distance. In this case, the demon was expelled from the girl without Jesus being present. It tells us very clearly, and she went home and found the child lying in bed and the demon gone. And finally, in Mark 9, 14 through 29, the healing of the boy with the mute spirit, some of the things that we learn, the distinction between physical ailments and demonic presence. Again, signs of the demonic include foaming at the mouth, the grinding of teeth, and the body becoming rigid. We also learn that not all exorcisms are successful. It says there, I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were unable. God is always in charge and will determine when a demon will be cast out. Even with that said, every time an exorcism prayer is prayed, it does bring some relief to the afflicted person even if at that moment, it does not bring about total liberation. In this passage, we also learned that one can be possessed for an extended period of time. In this case, we are told that the boy was possessed from childhood. We also learned that demon's main purpose is to destroy us. Again, the reason being that the human person has been created in the image and likeness of God. So it's important for all of us to have a clear biblical understanding of the reality of the devil and his demons. Because having that clear biblical understanding allows us to know that what the church teaches is true, it's real, and in, because of that, the ministry of exorcism is truly needed in the church today. When I was appointed, I became one of 12 stably appointed exorcists in the United States. That was back in 2005. We now have more than 150 trained exorcists in the United States. That's a clear indication that the church is listening and recognizes that she needs to respond to all those who believe they are up against the forces of the devil and his demons. Again, I wanna thank you for listening today and really encourage all of you to have a better understanding of the word of God. Don't be afraid to pick up the Bible and to put it into good and practical use. You know, I'm someone who likes to read these church signs that our brother and sister Christians put on their churches. I saw one the other day that said, let God be your steering, your steering wheel and not your spare tire. What does that mean? God needs to be in control of our lives. We can't just turn to him whenever we find ourselves in a, in a difficult and desperate situation. And the best way that we can allow God to be in charge of our lives is having a better understanding of his holy word as found in the Bible.